thank you guys all for your attention and finding your seats. Boris Fritz, an aerospace engineer with Northrop Grumman, with a quarter century of experience, an inventor with three patents to his name. He's also founded the National Nano Manufacturing Technological Group, Technical Group. As an engineering faculty member at the College of Science and Engineering at Loyola Marymount University, he's involved in teaching and research there. He's also a consultant to JPL. His research papers have been published worldwide, and he's the recipient of the Outstanding Engineering Achievement Merit Award of the Engineers Council of California. He projects into the future where virtual reality is real reality. Programmable material, like foglets, can be used to build homes that can be remodeled at will with holodeck-like rooms. I asked my son, what's holodeck? He says it comes from Star Trek, that's right. <laughs> Where interiors can reshape themselves, furnished with volumetric pixels that conform to users' needs, a bed at night, a desk or kitchen during the day. Molecular sized machines that will produce reciprocytes that will allow us to go without a fresh intake of oxygen for four hours. Please help me welcome futurist and inventor Boris Fritz. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, <laughs> it's really a pleasure to be here. I was here last year actually speaking on. Uh, ancient history and how it influences our times. And today I'm talking about a subject that I speak more about in terms of my work on nanotechnology. How many of you have heard of nanotechnology? Yeah, it's getting quite popular. And um, the kind of things that she was just introducing me with in terms of n what nano can do, we're going to have to kind of get to that point first, because uh, that all sounds pretty far out. But uh, in many ways, it is not. And so how do we start? How do we get into nanotechnology? The um, government is funding billions of dollars in R&D, other countries as well. Uh, it's expanding like crazy. If you look on the internet, it, there are endless websites, endless things going on. It's really almost impossible to know where to start. But um, in my case, the kind of work I've been doing at Northrop Grumman brought me into the nano area uh, from a unique perspective. I think this is a perspective that is very important to understand, and at the same time, it will give you an insight into nano that nobody else has, because this is not in any books. Uh, so the um, the way I uh, started on this, for some reason this is not <laughs> forwarding. Uh, we tried it earlier and it worked great. Um, there we go. Um, the way I kind of started in this is the Society of Manufacturing Engineers, which is a huge group that puts on uh, conferences of 50, 60,000 people across the country and in Canada, worldwide. Um, I was uh, the chairman of the Rapid Technologies Additive Manufacturing Community, and at that time, and back in 2003, I started these uh, technical groups, these uh, like national technical groups that cover these different areas, and my dream was to have one in nanotechnology, and because Society of Manufacturing Engineers deals with manufacturing, uh, there was no other group or anyone doing anything with nano manufacturing. You know, we deal with nano science, but to go to the next step into manufacturing at the molecular scale, so to say, uh, no one had done that. So at that time, I began this group, and so now it's a national group with um, leaders from all over the country involved in it, and it's quite exciting. And um, now, Oop, now it went the wrong way. Okay, here we go. Well, um, begin with how I got into nano is from this uh, community of uh, rapid technologies, which I'm involved with heavily. I run the labs at Northrop Grumman on this. And uh, what it is, it's an additive process 
of building something. You're used to subtractive processes like machining, like a milling machine, a lathe. We start out with a big build of material and then you whittle it down with a cutter to uh, get what you want, like a sculptor. But with uh, additive layer technology, also called rapid prototyping, rapid manufacturing, direct digital manufacturing, uh, with that, it's, you start out with nothing and build only what you need layer by layer. And what's so unique about that is you can do something like this. You design this in CAD, in, in the computer, as a solid model. Then what you do is you put it through a slicing algorithm that slices what each layer will look like. You bring that to the machine. In fact, these things are built on a machine that's around half a million dollars. And uh, you use a laser to scan, in this case, a nylon powder, which uh, solidifies it and then layer by layer builds it up. And so when you take this out of the machine, it's fully functional. Call this a brain gear. Uh, you'll see that there's nothing that you could assemble here. It's fully, it comes out as fully assembled. You can actually build a, like a grandfather clock in the machine, and it comes out fully functional. You just add the weights, and there it goes. So that's this kind of new way of uh, approaching things that I want to first cover before we get to the nanoscale because this is the kind of additive layer technique that's being used at the nano level, uh, not exclusively, but it's one of the main ones. And they'll give you an understanding why so many unique things can be made at the nano level as well because we can make these sort of fully assembled things at the normal scale. So I would like to pass this around. Uh, oh, actually, you know, let's go... Uh, I, when I show the next slide, it might be better to start from that point. But um, nanomanufacturing then, if we go down to the nano level, we're going to look later on in my talk at the transformation from outer technology that we read about so much to directly taking the technology into our own bodies. And that's going to change everything about us, and it's kind of scary in some ways, but that's happening in this next century. And uh, this is the one I love to use, you know. Okay, here comes the part where we always screw up. You know? And, you know, and how do you get the ship inside the bottle? Well, with additive layer technology, you design ins inside the CAD system, you already have the ship inside the bottle in your CAD design. And then when you slice it layer by layer for the computer to trace on the machine, like at this point right here, um, you, the, the ship would be already in there. And so the scanning by the laser of hardening the material at that level will include the ship. And so you build up layer by layer. And at the end, it closes up just like the bottle closing up at the top. This is already, it's all there. So that's the, the difference between normal manufacturing and this new way, which is kind of a revolution for the future. So I'll pass this around. You can play with it. It's a little addicting. Um, <laughs> and now this is the basic process. Uh, um, so what happens is that you have a, um, a part here that you're building. The part is underneath here. It's already, this is the portion already built inside. And then you come to the next layer, and the uh, laser is scanning and heat and melting the powder uh, wherever there is something to be melted for that layer of the model. And uh, then when that's done, then this platform moves down four thousandths of an inch usually, which is like the thickness of a human hair, so you don't even see it. And then there's a, a powder right here and here that moves up, and then the roller moves across to bring the pow new layer of powder across. Then the laser traces the next layer, and then the roller will move back when this moves up and rolls new powder across. So layer by layer, this part is sinking down, and uh, when you're done, it comes up, 
and you have to be like an archaeologist. You dig your parts out of the powder. And uh, here's how it works. The laser centers or almost melts the powder to form a single layer of the prototype. The build area piston lowers, and the roller deposits another layer of material to be centered. This process continues, and in a matter of hours, the entire part has been built. So, and that's an example of the machine right there. Um, now, we moved a little more complicated to the next level. Uh, one of the companies that makes this additive layer, they do metal powders. And you'll see that there's two different powder delivery systems. Actually, they have th as many as three that are pre-programmed to allow like titanium, aluminum, steel, other kinds of powders to be deposited into the, the uh, where the laser is on the substrate down here. And so layer by layer, you're building up parts that, for the first time in the world, make gradient materials. That is, you can imagine an engine block that's 100% stainless steel on the inside and then transition gradually to 100% copper on the outside to dissipate the heat. That way, you don't have d two different materials where you have the coefficient of thermal expansion where it uh, expands differently and separates. Here, it's all a transition. So we can do things we could never make before. And now the next step from beyond that, uh, well, here's an example of the first part that was made between uh, transitioning between two different types of titanium alloys. And <clears throat> um, now, from here, because I don't have a lot of time to cover all this, you know, I need hours. You know, um, we look at the factor of the future of this type of technology. And here you can see, um, this would be me probably with a cane right there standing in front, you know, <laughs> you know, 20 years. Um, and you see the aircraft right here being built layer by layer. There's no more assembly lines, no more tooling. Everything is built from the ground up layer by layer with different materials. at. Uh, working simultaneously. So when you work, like you build the rubber, you build the, the um, you get the electronics, uh, the wiring, everything is built layer by layer. So by the time this aircraft is finished, um, all you do is add the jet fuel and you're ready to go, fully assembled. Uh, now the important thing is this is not an aircraft factory. This is a factory of the future where the next part to be built on that uh, gantry there is a video camera or a Ferrari, whatever you want. You know, this is when we're talking about uh, what's a neat invention that we could you know, come up with earlier. Well, this would be one of them. <laughs> uh, what? Uh, I would sort of guess like in 20 years, something like that. Um, to a large degree, maybe fully in 30 years. But the thing, the reason I'm giving this talk is that this is going to be superseded by nanotechnology in many ways, uh, where we can make things right straight from the atoms on up. And uh, so uh, we're going to see some of this revol industrial revolution coming, and we're going to see <coughs> nanotechnology whisk it away into a whole nother level. So. Let's look at nanotechnology. Um, you know, I'm just taking you down now to a different level. But, but we're still doing additive layer. There's no change, except there are other ways of doing it at the nano. But the most important ones are uh, really the additive layer. And now nanotechnology deals with systems that have at least one dimension of about 1 to 100 nanometers. And a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. So if you take uh, 10 hydrogen atoms, put them next to each other, you get one nanometer. So it give you an idea how small that is. Um, now, a hydrogen atom is really one angstrom, and 10 angstroms make one nanometer. And then 1,000 nanometers is one micron or one micrometer. 1,000 microns is one millimeter. You know, metric system is so nice and simple that way. Um, <laughs> of course, some of you might, you know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> DNA molecule is about two and a half nanometers wide. So that's, uh, you know, amazing how small a DNA is. Uh, 
And in nanotechnology, it's bringing all these fields together. You know, you ideally would be, you require degrees in chemistry, biotechnology, quantum physics, uh, electrical engineering. And all these people have to work together. They have different types of uh, jargon, so it's not easy. But this is pulling all that together to make it happen. Now, to give you a sense of scale here, like uh, a human hair diameter is like 100,000 nanometers. Uh, what we're looking for is uh, 1 to 100 nanometers. In this area, that's the nanoscale. They're calling this larger area the mesoscale. But 1 to 100 is where we're working. And what's so unique about this little area is that anything above 100, like in this area, is what you call statistical physics, classical mechanics, all that sort of thing. You get down under one nanometer, uh, you get into quantum mechanics, which has whole different uh, ways of doing things. And so the problem is right in here is the transition area between quantum mechanical effects and uh, normal effects. And that's why we have to develop a whole new technology to deal with it. I'll give you a little insight into that. Um, now, uh, in case there are some professors that are going to ask you later here at UC Irvine about um, what you heard today, and he'll say he must have told you something about like top-down and bottom-up techniques, and you know. So I feel I better tell you real quick. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the idea is top-down in nanotechnology really is when you're dealing with microscopes, electron microscopes that can manipulate <coughs> tiny atoms. And those are atomic force microscopes, scanning tunneling microscopes. So you're dealing with like a big machine that can handle very tiny things. That's top-down control. The other one, bottom up, if you can read that, um, is basically someone once said, what's a nine-letter word for, uh, for nanotechnology? Well, it's chemistry. Um, although that's a misnomer because of course, chemistry is dealing with atoms, so it's nanotechnology, but not really because nanotechnology is where we, we're trying to control individual atoms. We want complete control. Chemistry just puts a bunch of you know, chemicals together and gets a reaction, and then you get something you can use at the normal scale. So from the bottom up, you, you know, affecting the atoms to get something you want, but you don't have control over the individual atoms. So that's a bottom-up technique where they're finding out ways of automating that uh, to make it happen. But the best thing we're looking for eventually is where we control billions and billions of uh, part. We make billions and billions of parts with billions of tiny tools that are nano tools. So that's what the, that's really the future. Now, to give you an idea of designing at the nano scale, what the difficulties are. Remember, I talked about. Uh, quantum mechanics coming into effect and all that. Here's the letter F. Now, it's not very smooth because it's made up of 1,660 aluminum atoms. So you see the individual atoms. That makes the surface very rough. So you're not going to have smooth surfaces at the nanoscale design. Now, the other problem is that this first uh, letter F that looks so nice is at zero Kelvin. That's absolute zero. And... Um, once, um, that's the ideal situation, once you bring that up to normal temperature, which is about 300 Kelvin, or um, like absolute zero is minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit, give you some idea. Now you bring that up to normal temperature, that letter F doesn't look very nice anymore. And because now you have Brownian motion, the whole thing is jiggling like crazy. So how do you design uh, at that level? And here's an example uh, from my friend Mark Sims. Uh, he's the founder of Nanorex. If you want to uh, write that down, nanorex.com, go to the gallery, and you'll see some of these things that they've designed. Uh, and one of the problems at the nano scale is uh, stickiness. Atoms tend to stick together, so how can you make a machine? Well, what you do is you have them statically uh, charge the same, so they repel each other. That way you can have this kind of a motor at the nano scale. So, so you're seeing not only the motion, but you're seeing the jiggling of the Brownian motion that's uh, happening at normal scale. 
I mean, at normal temperature. And here's an example of what the CAD system looks like. It's the first CAD system for nano design, and it's free. You can download it from nanorex.com and play with it. Um, <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> it's your assignment for tonight, you know. Uh, now, <laughs> what's interesting is that <laughs> what, what, else <laughs> what else do you find at the nanoscale? Um, the, it's, all matter becomes digital because each atom is a specific size. And all the atoms of the same element are completely identical. So when you're designing these motors that we just looked at, um, you know that everything's going to be identical. And they can't wear out. Uh, atomic bonds will never fatigue. So this, this thing that we were just looking at um, here will go on for eternity unless you add a lot of energy that gives a quantum jump to the next level for the electrons, that sort of thing. But overall, you know, this thing will just keep on going forever. Um, so no more of these no-go uh, go gauges and tolerance problems. You have digital perfection. So um, one of the applications is dip-pen nanolithography. Again, this is additive layer. That we're still talking about additive layer technology. But now we're looking at taking these tips of the atomic force microscopes and all the, micro, the electron microscope types is what makes nanotechnology possible that we can get down to that level. Then the new microscopes are uh, not passive like they used to be. They're active. The tips, you can actually place things. You can have fluids going down and, and, and make patterns and create... Uh, um, integrated circuits, that sort of thing. So that's what they're doing a lot with this. But one of the neatest things, like they have 55,000 pens of these. These are the smallest pens in the world. The tip is only 15 nanometers thick. Um, and what's happening is that they are able now to do like pharmaceutical counterfeiting problems. Uh, it's happening in like some of the third world countries. You have uh, fake drugs being sold by 50%, as much as 50%, whereas in the US it's down to 1%, which is still pretty big when you think of the billions of drugs that are being sold. Uh, but what they've done is they're able to um, mark each individual capsule or tablet uh, with a code that can only be seen with an atomic force microscope. So you can check. And, but they, they, they print on there where this thing is from, uh, how it's made, and, and you know that it's, uh, uh, when it has that on there, that it's uh, legitimate. And so this is one of the first uses of nano, uh, you know, to uh, prevent counterfeiting for drugs. And uh, now molecular beam epitaxy. Uh, this has been around since 1968, but most people don't think of it as nanotechnology. The, the compact disc players, uh, the lasers for that, are, are made this way. Layer by layer are grown, uh, perfect crystals, uh, and 70% of the world's supply of CD players are made by this way. And they can actually lay down the, the semiconducting laser uh, it's over a quadrillion atoms with as few as three atoms out of place. You know, I give you some idea of the precision that's possible that we're, we've been doing for several decades now. Uh, here's a picture of one at University of Texas in Austin. I was there just recently. And, uh, there, and I was at, at um, JPL, and they have a whole bunch of these. It's amazing. Expensive machines. You know. uh, now, we move to the next level, um, self-replication. And what's remarkable about this is that everybody thought we'd eventually get to self-replication at the nano level, but we're actually doing it with the kind of machines I'm, I showed you that make these kind of parts. And, you know, I apologize. I really meant to give these out for you to look at. Uh, these are some parts I grew on... Uh, on a selective laser sintering machine. You can take a look at, um, at some of these, uh, the kind of things that you can make that are quite remarkable. You can t twist this anyway. It comes out of the machine fully functional like this. Um, so you can play with that. I'll give you lot, <laughs> lots of neat toys, like how would you make this with a normal machine? You know, how do you get two balls inside of the other? 
Uh, and then this thing, you know, it's like all these gears, you know, working together. You know. <clears throat> and then uh, this uh, was grown. Um, uh, oh, you know, this one's, I'm sorry, I, I got you one that was frozen. These actually work. Um, and then also like an example of some metal parts like titanium and, and uh, you know. so all this is, you can't make in any other way except additive layer. Um, and so what's interesting is that we've been interested in self-replication for a long time, all the way back to Descartes uh, working with uh, um, Queen Christina of Sweden. <laughs> She asked him a lot of questions on self-replication back in the 1600s. And then John von Neumann came out with his famous work, Theory of Self-Reproducing Automata. And the simple example in nature of self-replication is fire. If you have the three things, uh, fuel, oxygen, and heat, fire will keep going forever. It'll keep self-replicating through the entire uh, forest or planet, whatever. And uh, so that's an example in nature. Um, now we're working like in England, RepRap Project, Fab Lab, MIT. Um, there are other things going on, Ideas Factory, where they're uh, working to, rep where one machine makes another uh, copy of itself, so to say. And um, the greatest payoff on this is at, nano, at the nano level, and I'll show you more of that. Here's an example of the machine. So it's laying down uh, layer by layer. and. You see all this uh, whitish uh, plastic? That's from the previous machine that made itself and grew its own parts. So, you know, kind of interesting. So these things are starting to happen. <laughs> I didn't know it was so funny. You know, but <laughs> uh, so it's been a dream for centuries, but now we're moving down to the nano level, and I'll show you a movie at the end that shows how we're, we can make anything we want uh, at the nano level like this. So um, now graphene. Um, you've all, you all know graphite. You've, uh, you use a pencil. And you think the pencil was used maybe back in Egyptian times or Greek or Roman times? No. Um, graphite was not discovered until uh, the 16th century in Great Britain. They found graphite deposit. They started using it. And then because it was so unique that you could uh, write on maps and things like that, the, uh, the British military uh, made it a trade secret that you couldn't take pencils out of the country at that time. So it was a you know, high technology at that time. But the reason I'm bringing up graphite is when you take, why does a pencil leave a mark? Because it's made up of sheets of graphene. Uh, these kind of sheets, a perfect, uh, uh, every like atom is perfectly placed. It's harder than diamond. And, but yet, you know, why does it happen? Does it come apart? Because Van der Waals bonding in chemistry and physics is a very weak bond. So these things shear off, and that's why you're able to write with a pencil. But in this case, when they started to get down, they found out that if you keep... Uh, uh, actually use sticky tape and keep pulling it apart over and over till they got down to, you know, real high scientific method. Uh, they got down to individual sheets of graphene and found out this is one of the most unique things in, in the universe. It's the thinnest uh, 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 structure in the universe. It's actually less than one nanometer in thickness, which is just amazing. And you curl it up and you get a carbon nanotube and you make it into a ball, and you get a buckyball. In fact, that one ball with two balls inside of each other that I'm passing around is just an upscale version of a buckyball. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> very upscale. You know. um, so, here you can see it, the thickness between uh, one sheet of graphene to the other is like eight angstroms. Remember, 10 angstrom is one nanometer. So, um, you know, that's, that's really down there. Like, like, that, like one sheet is like eight hydrogen atoms thick, if you want to get a visual of that. And we're working with this sort of thing. 
And the conductivity on this is so incredible that they're comparing, they're able to study things that happen inside stars and surface of black holes by working with graphene because of the incredible electrical conductivity of this substance. It's uh, unlike anything else. So um, just to give you another concept here uh, called the power shirt, that's just this year um, working with nanotechnology, they figured out a way of harvesting energy from physical movement by having two different types of fibers coated with uh, nanowires that, uh, uh, you know, at the nanoscale, and when they rub together, they create an uh, electrical current so that once we have these kind of shirts and clothes, it'll generate the electricity to power our um, hearing aids and our iPhones and iPods, whatever. So, you know, this is kind of the things that are coming. So it's starting to affect us, you know, in our daily life that way. And now, um, <clears throat> Uh, in the introduction, they mentioned about the respirocytes. Now, respirocytes are really fascinating. And they're really ab um, about as complex as a toaster, as one of my friends says, who's working on this uh, tea. In fact, tea uh, provided the slide for this. Um, what's interesting is that you think of normal blood cells, they can only take in so much oxygen and uh, give it to the cells and absorb so much carbon dioxide and take it back to the lungs to, you know, and uh, you exhale the carbon dioxide. Well, what if we came up with a, um, an artificial blood cell that can actually not just hold twice as much or 10 times as much oxygen, but imagine 236 times as much oxygen as a normal blood cell, and then uh, the same with the carbon dioxide, well, now imagine uh, you get 10% of your blood replaced by these uh, respirocytes, and now uh, let's say you're somewhere and you have a heart attack and your heart stops, and it says, oh, okay, I got respirocytes, uh, I've got time, no, no big deal, my heart stopped, you know, you call the hospital, <laughs> tell them, listen, I had a heart attack, my heart's not beating. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm going to stop off at the store, pick up some stuff, and I'll be over you know, in a little while, just have everything ready, you know, because you've got four hours before all the oxygen's used up. Now, and if you're a diver, no more diving equipment. You go down on, uh, under the ocean and do your work, and then you'll have certain respirocytes reprogrammed to absorb nitrogen so that you don't have the problems with the bends. In fact, uh, uh, when you're w way down... Um, deep in the water and you want to come up and you, know, you have to go through a deep compression which might take an hour or two, uh, this will take like one second to do the same thing. So you don't have that problem anymore. Uh, also for athletes, you know, when you're um, doing any kind of hard cardiovascular type of thing like runners, uh, 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 going for the mile, that sort of thing, your lungs can only provide so much oxygen per second. Well, with the respirocytes inside of you, you have so much more that you can, you know, we're going to make all kinds of new records <laughs> using respirocytes. Yeah. Uh, so there's um, a lot of unique things that can be done uh, with respirocytes. And my friend said, oh, if it takes us 20 years to do this, we're stupid. You know, it's like it's not that hard, he thinks. But, you know, and he's working on it. So... Uh, I would think it would at least be 20 years. But that sort of thing is when nanotechnology starts working inside of us and going inside our bodies, now it's getting kind of personal, right? <laughs> and so, you know, so I don't, you know, how much of this are we going to see? Well, it's, we're going to see a lot of it. And because it happens gradually, uh, we tend to accept it, not think about it. You know, we all carry our cell phones around, that sort of thing. And more and more, we're going to have things inside of us. Um, in fact, uh, uh, electronic, bendable electronics that will be inside. Uh, uh, but the biggest thing here, programmable matter. That's, you know, actually, you know, in the Terminator, this guy, programmable matter, he can reconfigure everything of what he looks like. And how is that done? Uh, my friend Josh Hall came up with this concept. He's one of the pioneers in nanotechnology. And <clears throat> it's, <laughs> it's kind of a funny quote here. But, um, but these are uh, foglets. And Josh Hall uh, um, 
he calls it also utility fog, but these individual pieces are foglets. So you imagine your television screen, you have, on your screen you have pixels, and imagine these pixels as voxels, volumetric pixels, and they'll be made out of these kind of things that they have all these bonds. Actually, you have 12 of these arms, and the arms uh, hook up with the other uh, foglets, and depending on the bonding strength of how, how hard they hold each other, if these are all over your floor, like trillions and trillions of them, then if you're walking on them, they can either be like a hardwood floor or it can feel like a soft, gushy carpet. Now, what's interesting is that other of these foglets are going to be um, all around in the air. You won't see them because they're too far apart, uh, so they'll just seem like normal air. But <clears throat> what happens is that so you wake up in the morning and you say the code word living room because you're done with your bedroom. All of a sudden, your bed, <laughs> being made of foglets, dissolves and uh, reforms into couches or whatever program you have set for what you want your living room to look like. Okay? And then, of course, you can have like, your TV uh, on, on anywhere. You can either have uh, foglets forming around you that... Uh, that condense more from the air and start to show you what's going on in TV or, uh, or you can watch a movie on the wall as, it, as you're walking along. Uh, but the more amazing thing is, let's say a friend of yours calls you from Australia and uh, you have a choice of either being in his room or uh, him being in your room. Let's say you're in his room, so you, you take that choice. Then all of a sudden, all your... Uh, furniture and your walls reconfigure to your friend's room and when you sit down you're sitting down on his couch you know, it seems like it's his couch and then of course your friend will, will be uh, materialized out of the foglets, you can shake his hand it'll feel like a normal hand and pretty soon you don't know what's real what's not real anymore <laughs> so you, know, you understand this isn't virtual you know, this is not virtual reality this is real, even though it's not, well, you could say it's a real couch, but you wouldn't say the friend is real because he's made of foglets. Um, and so, you know, there are fine distinctions there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> now, um, also, let's say you're done, you're done, uh, you're going on vacation. So you kind of like dissolve your house and let it be like a nice little uh, forest or, or a, like a, a garden, and then when you return, you put in the code of what kind of house you want, and the foglets reform it. And also, you'll be probably in a car made of foglets, riding on a road made of foglets, and if you ever hit something, all the foglets in the air around you will harden, uh, well, harden up slightly to absorb the shock so you would never get hurt. Um, and then... Like, if, you're, if you want to go to Disneyland, well, why go to Disneyland? Or if you want to play a video game, well, your whole house transforms into a world of Warcraft, and you're in there with your sword, and you're fighting monsters or whatever. It's, it's like, this is nothing like we could imagine before. And yet, these things are real. They're being worked on. In fact, there's some funding for the government right now to do some initial work on it. And... So we're going to see these things in, um, in 30, 50 years. We'll see small portions of it uh, not too long from now. Um, so what's the future looking like? Uh, well, Ray Kurzweil has a website. I think it's kurzweil.org or kurzweil.net. Uh, I'm German, so a Z is like a TS, you know, Kurzweil. You know, but the singularity is near when humans transcend biology. This is what I'm talking about, when all this stuff starts to move inside of us. Uh, <clears throat> gradual transformation, if like some of you, uh, you have s children that are growing up, uh, going to college, the thing that he recommends is uh, really... These three things are going to merge together into one subject. This is what you want to focus on. Really like biotechnology, nanotechnology, and robotics. And uh, now, as I said, you know, how things move inside our bodies. One of the things, uh, the nano skin, five microns thick, is going to be uh, happening um, in our, uh, possibly in our lifetime. 
you won't even know you have the skin on you. You can't see it, but it will completely control all your um, like temperature. In the Arctic, you'll be warm. In the tropics, you'll be cool. It'll uh, generate electricity for whatever things you need. Uh, also, gradually, what happens is that uh, the laptop and computer will be inside of us, the electronics will be inside, and then first you'll have like maybe uh, contact lenses, like a head-up display. So while you're walking um, in the, like somewhere in nature and you're lost, the GPS will come up and show you exactly, you know, overlay of where you are. But also eventually this will be inside your iris and you'll be able to do a head-up display of calculations, anything you need. You'd never need a computer. Computers are going to be gone in probably 20 years or so, because uh, it'll all be accessible inside of you. Um, so some of that stuff's kind of, you know, very strange. Uh, so what's next uh, after uh, nanotech, if we go smaller? Uh, there's no books on this yet. There's picotechnology and femtotechnology. In fact, femtotechnology in its infancy exists already where they're able with lasers to actually photograph the actual bonding of chemi chemical elements taking place at uh, femtosecond, which is 10 to the minus 15th. Remember, ten nanotech is 10 to the minus 9th. And then uh, femtotechnology is really working with protons and neutrons inside the nucleus. That's the scale of uh, femtotechnology. So there's all kinds of things coming at that scale where uh, we haven't even thought about yet. Um, now, uh, real quick, I want to show you the movie. Now, this is what's coming is the, the, the nanofactory, the desktop nanofactory, which can make anything you want, including uh, supposedly your food because you just... Uh, make it, uh, and of course it'll be normal, I mean, at the temperature you're going to eat it, so your steak, whatever is being made from individual atoms, will actually um, be ready to eat, so you'd never need a stove, you'd never need a refrigerator, because you would reuse all this stuff to bring it back to its normal constituents. So those are some of the things they're talking about. But to get a real clear idea of how this is done, Eric Drexler, the founder of nanotechnology, is working at NanoRex with Mark Sims, and they came up with this video that gives you some idea of what this is going to be like. So let me bring this up real quick. Productive nanosystems, from molecules to super products. Final production made possible by a challenge grant from Mark Sims and Nanorex Incorporated. Future advances in molecular nanotechnology will enable desktop appliances to manufacture products far better than today's best. The cartridges to the left supply simple raw materials to the machinery inside, here shown in schematic form. Products emerge from the top of this box, which holds the heart of the manufacturing system. Each product is built from beneath layer by layer, by billions of tiny machines, all working together. Near the top surface is the productive machinery itself, organized into layers. Machines in the lowest layer process molecules into building blocks, passing them upward to machines that assemble them into larger components, and then to machines that add these components to the product. From a millimeter scale, one million nanometers, our view zooms in to the 10 nanometer scale. Each box is one-tenth the size of the one before. Here, at the molecular scale, nanomachines make small building blocks from molecular raw materials. The first machines sort molecules by their size and shape, passing some, rejecting others. Only molecules of the right kind can enter the processing machinery. These molecules contain four atoms, two of carbon and two of hydrogen. The molecules bind to a device that carries them to the next stage. Then, a rotating mechanism swings tool tips into contact with the bound molecules. Each tip presses a molecular tool against a molecule, bonding it firmly. 
The tools shown here have been analyzed using advanced quantum chemistry techniques. Another tool moves in from the left to remove the hydrogen atoms, leaving a pair of carbon atoms exposed and ready to use. The tools then carry these atoms to their destination, where each pair bonds to a nanoscale building block, making a tiny bit of crystalline carbon, a bit of diamond. Motions happen quickly at this scale. This scene shows motion slowed by a factor of more than a million. A conveyor carries the blocks past further machines, which build the blocks step by step to full size. Elsewhere, other specialized machines build blocks of different kinds. A system of conveyor belts and transfer mechanisms carries completed blocks from where they are made to where they are needed. This transfer mechanism moves blocks from one belt to another. The transportation system carries many different kinds of blocks, different shapes, different materials, different functions. It delivers them to the next stage of manufacturing. Here, a programmable machine lifts and places small blocks to make larger blocks. The small blocks bond on contact to form components containing millions of precisely arranged atoms. These can be simple structural bricks or intricate components for mechanical and electronic systems. The completed components are delivered to the final assembly stage, where many machines work together to build the final product. Motions at this larger scale are still quick. This scene shows motion slowed by a factor of 10,000. At the base of each machine, a transfer mechanism grabs components and lifts them from a conveyor. Each is flipped around, then carried up to the underside of the product under construction. Finally, machines lift the components and plug them in place, adding layer after layer to the bottom of the product. When the last layer is finished and construction is complete, the product is ready to be removed and used. The result of this production run is an atomically precise multiprocessor laptop computer with a billion times more processing power than today's best. The only waste products are warm air and pure water. Well, there's really so much more to say, but uh, I think you kind of get the idea that this is uh, the future, and uh, this way with this movie, you really get a sense of the possibility of this actually happening, and um, some really amazing people working on it, and uh, with that, I conclude, and thank you very much. Oh, we also have...